Welcome to another episode of Outer Sounds. I'm here today with composer John McGuire, and we'll be talking about his album Pulse Music, which was just released by Unseen Worlds. Um, it is the January selection for Outer Sounds, and we're happy to have John here today uh, talking with us about his music and about this album. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? No, I feel fine, thanks. Except for the little cold, we're, we're, we're doing fine. Great, great. Um, before, obviously, before we get um, to the Pulse Music LP and, um, you know, how that came about and that music came about, love to just give a quick idea of, um, or quick background and history about, you know, how you got involved with music and composing. And, you know, I know that you've studied, you studied with some pretty well-known composers and uh, things like that. Would love to hear about um, some of those things, you know, leading up to, um, you know, that time. Sure. Uh, do you have a specific question on, on uh, concerning any of that? Yeah, sure. Just like, um, you know, when, when did you first start uh, composing music? And, you know, was it something you uh, started when you were young or not until you went off to school? Or how did that uh, come about? I was in college. Yeah. I, had a, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do in college, but we had a, I, I decided I'd take harmony because I'd never had a course in harmony. Mm -hmm. The teacher did something interesting. Toward the end of the semester, she said, okay, now take what you've learned and write a piece and we'll have a concert. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and, uh, and uh, that was the start of everything, really. <laughs> I just love doing it. I loved performing it, and uh, there was no backing down after that. And were you also, uh, you know, a trained musician, a piano player, or uh, something like this as well? Well, I played played a lot in uh, piano, and uh, I'd studied piano for some ten years, and and also the French horn. Okay. Uh, I'd played the French horn and youth orchestras for, for like six years or something like that. So I had a good mm -hmm. grasp of, of uh, musical events. Yeah. And, uh, I just never thought of myself as a composer. I guess I mm -hmm. was too much coming from a working class background to, to right. <laughs> uh, conceive of being anything that fancy. But then once I tried it, there was no going back. Yeah. <clears throat> when you catch the bug you gotta keep keep going with it right yeah yeah well i, I grew up uh, being sung to my father was a singer an irish tenor mm -hmm. and uh, so i grew up with songs like danny boy and my wild irish rose and all that stuff he sang lullabies to me uh, to put me to sleep mm. and uh after that, it was some years until I saw a movie that really set me off in music. Mm -hmm. It was called Young Man with a Horn. Okay. You know that movie, that's with uh, a, a, a sort of quasi-biography of Bix Beiderbeck. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Kirk Douglas. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that was for me. You know? Yeah. It was very dramatic. I don't know if I was drawn to the music or the drama. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but that was where it started really great and so you went you went to occidental um yeah right? yeah yeah and then um after that you you studied in europe right with um stockhausen and and gottfried koenig right well when i was at occidental i also went in the usc summer program okay most memorable summer I had was 1963, where I studied with Ingo Dahl. Okay. And it really did change my life. Here was a model of a, of a great musician and composer who was uh, like a role model, right? I was, I was very impressed by Dahl. 
Um, and then in the summer, of, then, then I went up to Berkeley after Occidental mm -hmm. and uh, came back down <laughs> from, <laughs> down to LA to study with Carl Cohn one summer. Okay. That was another wonderful role model for me. Yeah. And, uh, Cohn helped me get the scholarship to go to Europe. He thought that was quite appropriate. Mm -hmm. At one point, whatever you do, don't go to Princeton. So I, <laughs> I went to Europe and uh, uh, found out right away that Penderecki, was, who, whose work I had gotten to know in San Francisco and quite admired, mm -hmm. was uh, coming to Germany to teach guest professorship at the Volkbankschule in Essen. And uh, so I went just to work with him. I spent two years studying with Penderecki. Oh, nice. That was like uh, two hours a week, two meetings a week for two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So it was very intense. It was a lot of work. And yeah, I learned most of what I know from him. That's great. Then, oh. then in the summer, there were the Stockhausen courses in Darmstadt. Okay, yeah. I went to, I, I got into that seminar situation and uh, <clears throat> he became my teacher, sort of, so to speak, in electronic music because he knew so much about it and mm -hmm. could teach anything, anything about that subject at that time. Was so that those the Oh, sorry. Was that the first time you um, either encountered or started working with electronic music? Let me think about that. No, it wasn't actually. I had I had started that with friends of mine in the Bay Area. Okay. I think it was 1965 that I saw the first synthesizer it was on display at the San Francisco Tate Music Center. It was a bukla box. Yeah, that was a bit important. I thought the sounds were fascinating. I loved this gizmo and and I wanted to find out more about it as much as I could. Yeah. With the idea eventually finding a situation in which I could make a piece, an electronic piece. And I finally found that situation ten years later. Okay. Yeah, in, yeah. In Cologne. Mm-hmm. So after you, um, you know, finished, finished school and you were studying, you know, with these composers in Europe, um, did, it, did you stay and live in Germany? Is that right? I did. Yeah. I stayed there until 1998. Okay. So that was 32 years in, in Germany. <laughs> so were you just, com you were composing and teaching during that time? I was mostly composing. I had uh, six uh, commissions from the West German radio, mm -hmm. three of which were for the electronic studio. And it had long been my dream to work in that studio, because I so admired some of the works that had come from there. Yeah. For example, I knew almost by memory the Gesangte Jünglinge of Stockhausen and the Kontakte of Stockhausen, whose score I translated from German into English. Oh, nice. I listened to these pieces like 50, 50 to 100 times. Yeah. So I knew them very well. And uh, I thought, that's I want to go somewhere like that someday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, additive synthesis. What's the other one <laughs> we call? We call. I have that uh, granular synthesis. Those were that studio was the first place that I know of that techniques of that kind were really tried out on a on a big piece producing scale. And uh, that was where I started when I started in the studio with uh, additive synthesis in East Pulse Music 3. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So tell me, um, tell me how the Pulse Music pieces um sort of developed and kind of your your idea or vision for those pieces and how you managed to, uh, you know, put them together. 
Okay. Uh, well, let me let, let me run through this in my head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, it, it, it requires that I tell you about a piece that I wrote just before I did the electronic studio. It was yeah. a piece for four pianos. A freeze for four pianos, it's called. Okay. And um, after that was finished, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. But I had a good friend. His name was the, the musicologist Richard Toop. I asked him what he thought I should do. And he said, why don't you try an electronic piece? Mm. The uh, University of the Arts in Cologne had just been completely rebuilt. It had a really very fine electronic studio, well equipped mm -hmm. with a two inch 16 track tape recorder, and a giant mixer designed by the technician there and uh, an ARP 2500. So there was a lot, there was really a lot one could do there. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing I did was, uh, well, I, I, I skipped. After I'd finished the piece for four pianos, <clears throat> it took me four years to write. It was very a lot of mental work. Okay. So I, I didn't want to do any more mental work for a while. <laughs> uh, I uh, started improvising on the piano. I said, "There are no rules. I'm just going to put my hands on the keyboard and see what happens." Yeah. Um, and I did this for three months every day, several hours every day, just seeing what happened. Mm -hmm. the, it turned out that what happened was I kept improvising, repeating patterns, mm. uh, much to my surprise. And they all had this characteristic of being uh, three against four. Mm -hmm. How do I know this? Well, I wrote them all down. Once I, once I had played them a, a few times, I could write them down. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of phase shifting basis. And uh, when I started in the electronic studio at the University of the Arts, I took one of these improvisations with me and tried it out on the big tape recorder on the 16 track. Hmm. And uh, that became the basis for the Pulse Music One. Uh, so you were overdubbing piano parts to try to get these interlocking patterns, but then you decided to produce the piece electronically after you made this kind of like demo sort of. Well, it was, it was a demo. It's it's on this. It's on the uh, LP. It's called okay. One Hundred and Eight Pulses. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This cycle took 108 uh, uh, control pulses. But what yeah. we did first was to try to figure out how to coordinate or synchronize different levels, different um, tracks on the tape. So if, if I would play one track, bump, 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 or whatever. Mm -hmm. I would try to synthesize, synthesize uh, synchronize another track exactly in um, in sync with uh, with the first track. Yeah, it turned out I couldn't do it. Yeah, that's tough. This this is the world before uh, MIDI and computers and all that stuff. So, <laughs> well, it wasn't before MIDI, but it was no, impossible. Yeah. It was impossible to. Uh, do it that way. That was the wrong approach. Yeah. So the technician I was working with said, why don't we take pulses, record them on this tape, and then allow them to drive the sequencer in the in the analog synthesizer. That wow. worked. That so was like a control worked. voltage kind of situation. Yeah. Yes, a, a control voltage situation in which I had suddenly I had perfect synchronization on 16 tra 15 tracks yeah uh, one of them had the pulses on it right <laughs> and uh, i had to control over a whole <laughs> work really and so i just started taking the thing and adding layer after layer after layer 
get the eight layers, um, mix them down to two, okay. and start all over again. And so finally, I think the piece itself took 30, 30 tracks. Mm -hmm. And that was that was how we proceeded. It took two years, but it was it took quite a bit of finesse. But uh, that's that's how it was done, and that's the source of the title too. That's why I called it pulse music. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, controlled by pulses from the tape, moving back onto the tape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, reading through some of the you know liner notes and other notes it sounds like um you know there's kind of this discussion of kind of uh a marriage of serialism and minimalism where you um you know also kind of having studied in germany and all that but also like you know a fan of you know steve reich and terry riley and philip glass and all that stuff as well or is this something that kind of you developed just on your own? Well, I think the first piece that, because of where I was living, mm -hmm. the first quasi minimalist piece I heard was in 1967, uh, when I heard the uh, the Stimmung of Stockhausen, mm -hmm. which made a tremendous impression on me because of the many different tempi. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, did, I didn't want to give up, uh, as, I, as it seemed to me to be the case in many of the American minimalists, a flexibility of tempo. Hmm. I wanted there to be a, a simplicity, yes, but there had to be tempo, yeah. tempo, a richness of tempo change. Like I think Pulse Music One has 24 different tempi in it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know. I hope you hear that. Yeah, you can hear all, all these different layers happening. It's 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 fantastic. Um, so after you finished uh, Pulse Music One, how did the? I know that uh, it was kind of scored or translated to the instrumental, you know, ensemble version um, that we hear. That's Pulse Music Two. How did that come about, and and how was it? Uh, were there difficulties trying to translate, you know, this electronic piece into uh, instrumental piece that performers could play? Well, it was really uh, a, a different structure, mm -hmm. a different kind of a structure in Pulse Music 2. It seems like I'm always emphasizing that aspect of composition. Um, so it was just an idea that ha happened to generate a four piano texture, more or less automatically. I won't go into details there because it's a little hairy, but yeah. <clears throat> but that was, uh, and I happened to know four excellent pianists in Cologne. I was friends with uh, several of them, and they were all willing to participate. And. Uh, so it took me two years to write the piece. I wrote it more or less simultaneously with the uh, Pulse Music One. Oh, okay. To, so to to scribble out the score took two years, mm -hmm. and then it was done in 1978 at Radio Bremen, mm. where uh, the man who ran Radio Bremen, his name was Hans Otta. He uh, <clears throat> he was very friendly toward American music and put this on right away, so, okay. So That's that was how that happened, just that one performance, though. So. Okay, yeah. And then, and then you moved uh, from that and developed the Pulse Music 3, right? Well, yeah, basically I did. I had a, a I'll go into a little background on that, too. Yeah. Um, good friend of mine, his name is Walter Zimmermann. He's mm -hmm. a He's now a professor of composition uh, emeritus, I think, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he had been offered a commission to work at the Vedi Air in the studio, except he couldn't do it. He had other engagements at the time, so he recommended me. And that's how I, I jumped at the opportunity, of course. And <clears throat> that, was, uh, that was that. 
I just started thinking as fast as I could about <laughs> what's next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with Pulse Music 3, you know, it's another electronic kind of variation on this idea. What were some what were some things that you maybe learned from making the first one that you wanted to do differently or, you know, change, change it um, by the time you, you know, made this third version? Well, I just had a different uh, idea, mm -hmm. idea. What I wanted to do was make uh, two layers of alternating pulses, a fifth apart, ding, dun, 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 dun where one goes across the room and starts again and goes across the room again, yeah. over and over again, while the other one, 180 degrees off, the alter al alternating set of pulses okay. starts uh, when, when one set gets to the left, the other one starts on the right. And so we get this mm. constant circling around you can hear or you can hear that i think i think, i hope on the on the uh <clears throat> on the on the recording uh though, yeah. though that was uh, i did it quadraphonically the constant circling around which i just described uh, is is moving constantly from left to right it's going like this mm -hmm. well the uh there's another set that's going constantly from front to back. It's going like this. Yes. <laughs> Forms a kind of moving cross. Yeah. And uh, uh, it worked quite well. Uh, the, uh, I, I learned things, of course, when sounds are moving from left to right, you hear them very easily because your ears are where they are. When yeah. you're moving from front to back, you don't hear them very well. Right, <laughs> because you don't have ears here and here. <laughs> That's right. You need another set of ears. Yeah. So this was partially successful, and I felt the other part. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not so sure I want to do that again. <laughs> uh, but we tried and tried and tried. I had a. Uh, uh, I was working with a sound engineer. His name was Volker Müller who uh, was willing to try anything. It's my dream collaborator here. Mm -hmm. He'd try anything to make suggestions, but we never did really get this one right. Mm. Yeah, I, I really like the, the third piece a lot. I think it's, it's uh, maybe my favorite of the, of the Pulse Musics, um, but. Okay. So, um, you know, after you finish these pieces up, it, it was like the, late seventies, early eighties. Um, and you, did you return back to electronic music or you decided to kind of move off and compose, uh, you know, just for instruments and pianos again? Well, I, uh, frankly, the situation at the West German radio, I had been there making for seven months, yeah. work seven days a week at Pulse Music 3, and I thought, this was utopia, I'll never get that again. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll forget, forget about that aspect. But then some 10 years later, <clears throat> I completely ran out of money. So oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I asked the head of the new music department, his name was Wolfgang Becker at the time, uh, if I could maybe have another commission to work in the studio. So. Mm -hmm. He very generously gave me that opportunity. And that was when I started again on a piece called Vanishing Points. Okay. That's, yeah. I think that's due to come out also on this label. I don't know when, but it could be. Yeah, uh, Tommy mentioned that to me as well, the Vanishing Points and Acapella, right? Right. Those pieces, yeah. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. I have I have the CD of that, and I really like, I like those a lot too. Um, <laughs> So uh, why did uh, why did you end up returning to the United States after so many years? Um, and what have you been doing since you returned in, in the late 90s? Well, uh, part of it's personal. My mm -hmm. family got very ill. Okay. Thought the treatment might be might be uh, something 
over which we would have greater control if we moved back to the States. Yeah. For the reason that my English is much better than my German. And I have to, you need to convince people if you're in an emergency situation, it really helps if you can speak their language. <laughs> yeah, but uh -huh. so that was that was one of the reasons. That was the main reason, in fact. What did I do when I got back? Well, various things. Mm -hmm. I was editor at Carl Fisher for a while, okay. proofing high school band music, which was no fun at all. And <laughs> then I uh, I took a a little walk around the campus of Columbia University and noticed in the catalog that an old friend of mine was teaching there, Jonathan Kramer. Mm -hmm. I wrote to him right away and say, hey, can I do something there too? And he said, sure. Yeah. Um, you can teach uh, uh, introduction to contemporary music. So that's what I did for, for five, six years. I taught at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Quite enjoyed it, but I didn't get much written during that time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and after that, I, 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 I sort of quit. I didn't really like the whole situation with the academics and yeah the, the the various kinds of compulsion that come up with academicism uh i found a lot of it really un uninteresting let's say and so i quit teaching there and went back to full time writing yeah that's what i've been doing ever since there's been a piece for orchestra. There were three big string sextets and uh, stuff like that. Nice. Have you, um, well, a couple questions related to that. Um, will, will there be, um, you know, recordings released of those, your, these recent pieces that you're talking about? Well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the first of the string sextets. Oh, I should mention that the Berlin performance of the orchestra piece was a fiasco. Yeah. Uh, don't want to, we don't want that to be re released. I want to that, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the first performance of the first of the string sex tets, it's called Jump Cuts, uh, was quite okay. Mm -hmm. That was the, uh, the Ensemble Modern in Frankfurt, a terrific group. And uh, the other two haven't been done yet. Okay. So I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. As usual, one doesn't necessarily know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. When you're you're writing music for other people to perform, um, have you returned to electronic music at all? And have you, you know, obviously with the the changes in technology, it's uh, it's become almost easier than ever to have you know a little studio at your house or whatever and, and make <laughs> make pieces uh composed directly you know that way have you been involved with any of that or just mostly um, i have not no standard, yeah standard <laughs> compositions like like uh my what happened with pulse music three i said it was a utopian <laughs> situation which i didn't hope to repeat yeah, I've had three of those utopian situations, which aren't going to repeat. And uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Yeah. In, in the first place, I don't have any money, so <laughs> I would have to buy a couple of things. Yeah. I don't really want to do that. So. Yeah. I mean, I can get along okay with with a simple keyboard. Yeah. There you go. Um. So kind of to wrap things up, I just wanted to um, uh, ask you how you, um, you know, how you got in touch with Tommy at Unseen Worlds and how you feel like, you know, getting some of this music out again to perhaps, you know, different audiences and listeners, how that might, um, how that feels for you. Well, uh, Tommy contacted me. Mm -hmm. He'd heard these pieces and thought it would be cool to make a record. So I said, I, I was very skeptical at first because there, there, there was the electronic pieces. Three of them were already on uh, Sargasso Records. Right. The CD so, only, though, right? Is that right? Or me? Were, were they CDs only originally? Or CDs only? Yeah. yeah. 
the first time on vinyl. <clears throat> this is the first time on vinyl, yeah. Um, yeah, but eventually he, he uh, persuaded me that this would be a, an okay thing to do. Yeah. I it was, at first I thought it was kind of unethical, you know, the, the Sargasso people had worked hard on getting this done. They had communicated with the West German radio, which mm -hmm. is extremely difficult, believe me, you're, you're talking about a gigantic bureaucracy. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but Tommy persuaded me that it was okay that we could, we could, uh, proceed mm -hmm. without worrying too much, I guess. Right. <laughs> That's that's how that's how that got uh, started. I'm I'm rather glad it did get started too. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's uh, you know, I think it's a good way for, you know, some younger people or just different audience to discover your music and these pieces and um I'm glad Tommy is doing it and it sounds like he's doing another uh another release with you as well, which I think that'll be great. So um, I'm, I'll be doing my part with, uh, the outer sounds subscription. I'm, I'm sending out about, uh, about 70 copies of the LP to different subscribers. So you'll have some new listeners, uh, checking out this music. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I started out with the record of the month club. Yeah, there we go. I <laughs> talking Stravinsky way back when. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Trying to bring that back. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I want to thank you for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you luck with uh, all your new music. And um, and hopefully we'll be getting a lot of new listeners onto some of your pieces here and hearing some new stuff from you as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks and take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.